Odds are you think you're a pretty good videographer, but chances are you're just an average videographer. My name is John Cooksey and I want to welcome you to our tape on black belt camera techniques. These are techniques used by the broadcast professionals world over. You're going to see things on this tape that I guarantee you're not using now, even if you're an award-winning videographer. Speaking of which, I put videographers into two classes. The two classes are number one, award-winning videographers. These are people that are currently winning awards now or have the, certainly have the potential to win awards. Their work is excellent, they're doing all sorts of creative shots, they're constantly striving to do better. They know that even if they pick up only a few different techniques on this tape that they hadn't thought of before, it'll be well worth the investment because they'll add them to their arsenal of techniques. The other kind of videographer is just the average mediocre videographer. A lot of these videographers think they're great. They don't get complaints. They've been shooting for many years. They have a great tripod. They're self-taught. We've heard all the excuses. But this can actually hinder them by thinking you're really good when you're not because then you stop learning. The award-winning or black belt videographers know they can never stop learning. No, they always have something else to learn. And I promise you, no matter what category you're in, whether you're the award-winning videographer or you're the other category, the person striving to be like that, you will learn things from this video that you will be applying to your videotape productions. Broadcast professionals are using shots on television every night that videographers around the country, whether they're videography for documentaries or they're videotaping weddings and events or sports or cable television, they're not using these techniques. And the real shame about this is it doesn't cost anything to learn these techniques. You can watch them on TV and take notes. This videotape is going to be a shortcut. We're taking the best of the best techniques and applying them on one tape. That means in the course of this hour or so, you're going to have a cram-packed information that you can take on the job with you. We've also included a shot list. With these two things and reviewing the tape every couple of weeks, you'll be able to change the way you shoot forever. As videographers, we're often fascinated by the latest, greatest piece of equipment that's going to make us more money, that's going to make us better, that's going to get our resolution better. But then, by focusing on that stuff, we stop focusing on camera technique. It's only natural to find out what the latest, greatest toy is. But the important thing is the camera work, telling the story. So come take a journey with me as we show you the different techniques that the broadcast pros use to make their work better than any other videographers. Right now we're going to talk about the five essential positions that you must do to be a creative camera person. And they're simply this. Position number one, at the ground level. Great for getting some low level shots, tilt up the viewfinder. You're going to be able to get some fantastic shots from this level. As a matter of fact, broadcast camera people use this all the time. They also use position two, which is right at the waist. Again, you have your viewfinder tilted up and it allows you to get many different angles and it's not really that threatening to people. You can sneak in real close. It's a great position. Position three is very close to that. Simply bringing it up here. This is nice if you need to get in close to people, but you don't want to get too close and be too threatening right underneath. I use this a lot in real tight quarters and it's very similar to the one that we're all accustomed to position four. Now position four obviously is the one that the camera is designed for, but it's not necessarily the most creative. So position four you're going to use for a lot of things, but other positions may come in much more handy when you're doing creative shots. Of course position five, right over your head, tilt the viewfinder down. After a while you won't even have to tilt the viewfinder down because you will be able to understand what you're getting. Use, use your camera on wide and use position five for a lot of nice hang, high angle shots. You can stand on a chair, you can get on a fence or something and get that extra high angle. Or if you're not on a fence, this brings your camera up a lot more than you're used to. So to review the positions for creativity, the five positions starting at the ground level. Position one, I use this one a lot for a lot of ground level shots. It's really handy. And position two, right at the waist. This is going to come in a lot handy for doing some quick pans and some landing on shots and some rack focus. This is a very good one. Position three, right underneath, tucked in here. It also allows you to look around, see what's going on, and then videotape. 
Position four, not as easy to look around because you got your camera blocking over your shoulder here, but a good standard shot. And of course, position five, way up here. Now, if you use these positions equally and disperse them all through your video, you're going to show your creativity goes up quite a bit. If you use these combination with what I call the Waldo technique, your creativity is going to go tenfold. Let's go to the Waldo technique next. For years, I've been looking for ways even to train the most advanced camera person to be much more creative on the job. Now, this is not always easy to do. You're on the job, you're hot, tired, you're thinking, how can I get more creative? Well, I've come up with a way that's simple, and if you remember one word, you can be much more creative. That's called Waldo, and it's spelled a little differently. It's spelled W-A-L-L-D-O. I'm gonna tell you now exactly what that stands for and how it's gonna make you much more creative. The W in Waldo stands for wide. Now this doesn't mean you're gonna be taking all wide shots to be creative. It simply means that a lot of creative shots are done with the camera in the full wide position, most of the time getting closer to your objects. This will enable you to get depth of field and perspective that many times you can't do from a zoomed in position. The second thing I wanna to talk to you about is angled shots. Some of the top broadcast professional people use angled shots all the time. Now this means when you're videotaping signs and when you're videotaping people and buildings and stuff, if you want to get creative, I want you to think angles. Angles add a three-dimensional perspective to something which is pretty much two-dimensional, the television screen. It's amazing how many people call themselves professionals, yet they neglect to get the low angles. I'll show you what I'm talking about now. Angles like this. Broadcast professionals get these angles all the time, every shoot they do. Why? Because they add some perspective, they give the object some dominance, and they're really creative shots. On your next job, use low angles like this or low angles like this to give the viewer an interesting perspective and to vary it with your other shots. A linking shot is one of my favorite shots. It allows you to attach two subjects in the same scene together by various means, as you see here. Linking shots are great because you can't always get everything in the same shot, but this allows you to connect things and bring the viewer emotionally together, attaching two different subject matters in the same shot. Sometimes this is done with rack focus, sometimes this is done with a pan, sometimes this is done with a pullback. A linking shot is used all the time in broadcast TV and it's up to you as a professional videographer to use linking shots as much as you can. Another way to be extremely creative is through the depth shots. Now depth shots can be putting the thing in the background way out of focus or using a rack focus or going in with a low angle to add depth to the scene. Depth is very important when it comes to creativity because once again, you're talking about a two-dimensional medium, the television screen, and trying to make it more three-dimensional. So when you're thinking creative, you want to think of depth shots. An opposite shot is simply the reverse of what you would normally videotape. If you're videotaping at a ground level, it may be a high angle shot. It may be a reverse angle shot. It could be a, any number of different shots that are not normally done. Opposites are what creativity is all about. It brings the reverse into the shot. It allows the viewer to see a different angle and it gives more perspective to your television picture. The opposite principle can be hard to understand at first, but the more opposites you see, the easier it will be to understand what they are and how to use them to be more creative. Now let's see an example of how to put Waldo to use immediately in your videotaping. Suppose you were hired to videotape a small airplane at the airport. Some videographers would do the average boring shots. But you, knowing the Waldo technique, have the power to keep the viewer's interest. So let's take a look at how a broadcast pro would videotape the scene.
your own advanced camera techniques is easy. There are three basic elements. First of all, your shot idea, and you're going to see more of these later. Second of all, one or more of the creative formats, wide, angled, low, linking, depth, and opposite. And the third thing is one of the camera positions, one through five. For this shot, we wanted to show the barbecue at the lake. Nothing was set up except the bottle was moved for the best composition. Note all the different elements in the same scene. Earth, fire, water, wind, and of course, food. The average videographer has been conditioned to the nightmare of unwanted backlighting, and as a result, they tend to forget about backlighting as an artistic shot. But the broadcast pros use backlighting all the time as a creative element. To do this, get a bright scene and turn down your iris control until the foreground becomes dark. These backlight shots are mainly done in camera position 1, 2, and 3, and creative formats wide, angle, and low. If you really want to be as good as the broadcast pros, you're going to have to start using reflection shots. Chances are you're not using reflection shots now. It's time to change. You haven't been using them because you weren't aware of how important they can be to your video production. The top pros in the countries use these all the time because they fall into two categories, the opposite and linking. Plus, they add extra dimension and depth to your camera work. Make sure on your next job you try to incorporate at least one reflection shot in the work you do. The walk out of frame shot is one of my favorites because it's not just a shot, it's also a transition. It simply involves letting your subject walk out of the frame as a transition into your next shot. Once again, the subjects go out of the frame as you'll see, and it brings you to your next shot. This is done all the time on broadcast television and it's up to you to start doing these. So don't always pan the subject as they go by your field of view. Make sure you let them go out of view sometimes and it creates an excellent opportunity to bring you to your next shot. The walk out of frame shot is considered one of the benchmark techniques that separates the amateur videographer from the professional. The best way to master this technique is to try it when you're not on the job, take your camcorder downtown and practice it a couple times. Once you do that, you'll probably use it on every job you do. If I see a shot on TV I really like and I'm managed to be able to record it, I can either freeze frame and take a sketch of it, or I have a video printer and I get a shot of the angle that I like and I want to be creative, I can then bring that, show the camera person I'm looking for this kind of angle. I can even show it right to the screen and he can move and adjust to get that same angle that we see in the print. This is a great way of being able to transfer some kind of angle and some kind of thing that you see on television directly to what you're doing as we're doing here. You take a shot off TV of the angle you like or you sketch it out as best you can and then you're able to bring that along to the job to give yourself an idea and to give the cameraman an idea of exactly what you're looking for. When videotaping inside a building, the average videographer forgets to get door frame shots. Broadcast pros use the door frame all the time to give it more insider voyeuristic view. It's okay to get the subject, but once in a while get the door frame too. It's used all the time on broadcast television. Here's a shot without a door frame, and here's the shot with the door frame. It's not made to replace the regular shot, but to be used in conjunction to add more of a three-dimensional image to your two-dimensional television screen.
It's your job as a videographer to be the best videographer you could be and that requires practicing, learning from other people and trying to be the top person there and that's going to happen through creative camera work. You know when you're the top person out there you're going to be the first one called for jobs. You're going to be the one that customers go to first because everybody knows hey Joe Smith he's the best in the area or Mary Jones she's the one to hire as a videographer. Once you get to be one of the best camera people you're gonna have a, a few other camera people that are jealous out there gonna say oh why does he get all the jobs why does he think he's so good or she thinks she's so good that's okay you can put up with that because you also have a lot of people coming up to you and say wow I really like your work I can't believe how many videographers around the country are not doing rack focusing. You're seeing it here and this is the way you want to practice. Put your background way in the distance, zoom in tight, get your shot and use your focus ring to go back and forth between the background and the foreground. A lot of times on broadcast TV this is used to videotape a prison where they have the barbed wire being rack focused in the foreground, used to rack focus between two people, used to rack focus between a sign and a building. Rack focusing is used all the time on broadcast TV. It's your duty as a videographer to go out there and practice. As a matter of fact I want you to stop the tape right after this sentence here. Go out and videotape using rack focusing practice and see what you get. One other tip if you have an ND or neutral density filter built into your camera or you can get one at a photo store for about five or ten dollars this will make the rack focusing a little easier because it cuts down on the amount of light going to the camera. Point of view shots are shots where the camera takes on the perspective of the subject. For example, this cart driver or this cup of coffee. Point of view shots are a secret of award winning videographers that they don't often share. These shots are used to give a you are there look and help keep the viewer's interest. They would fall into the opposite category under Waldo. Point of view shots are most effective when used between standard shots of your subject like here with baby Olivia. Here's the point of view shot and we go back to the standard shot. Point of view shots are used by broadcasters in so many different ways. The great thing about them is they can be done with people or with objects. So the next time you're on a job, try to incorporate point of view shots into your videotaping. Here are a few more examples of different ways you can use point of view out on the job. When we began this video we decided my on-camera headshots would be best done in a quiet out of the way place. So we took off for a couple days to a beautiful area 30 miles from town. I took with me award winning videographer Joe Correa. We chose Lake Washita State Park because of its scenic backgrounds and because they had cabins that overlooked the beautiful lake. I always look forward to working with Joe because he's not only a good camera person but he's a good friend. Okay, let's stop the tape right here. You've come far enough along that it's time for a quiz. When watching the last section of the tape about the trip to the lake, were you A, getting involved in the story, B, noting different camera shots and angles, or C, eating pretzels? If you chose B, you're correct and can skip the next section. If you chose A or C, well then it's time to learn the special way that videographers watch TV. Hi, my name's Annie and I'm really excited about something. I've learned how to watch TV. Used to be really tough for me, but now it's really easy. All I need are these three remotes. This one you turn on and then you have to turn this one on because this sets up the whole system and then you switch back to this one for the VCR and you turn it to line input and then you get on this one and you can switch all the different channels, but none of that will work unless you have this one on because this one is for the volume control. And then if you want to watch a video, you go back uh, to this Annie, one and then Annie, you... Um... That's not exactly what we had in mind by how to watch TV. Oh. In many other artistic mediums, you look at what the artist does and you really can't figure out how they did it. But with video, it's so visual that what you see is what you get. It's not like trying to figure out a magician's secret. You can learn it by watching television every night. 
well, why don't people do that? Why don't videographers get down and take out a pen and paper and take notes? Well, the people of the award-winning caliber, the black belt videographers, like I say, constantly do that, even if they've been in video for many years, because they know they can always learn something more. And it's there on TV to see every night, and it's free. So you might as well take advantage of it. The reason most videographers do not take advantage of it is because they do not detach themselves from the story. So here's the big secret. When you're watching television to pick up techniques, number one, of course, have a pen and a notepad, but number two, be willing to detach yourself from the story. Just look at the camera techniques. A good video director, editor, whatever, will make a story so you get caught up in it that you do not notice the cuts, that you do not notice the different camera techniques and all that kind of stuff. So, and that's, that's good. They're doing their job. But you have to remove yourself from watching the story and just watch the different techniques. When you do that with a pen and a notepad, you're going to notice so many different techniques that you're going to be able to incorporate into your own work. Now that we know the right way to watch TV, let's review the different shots we've seen. We have the opposite shot from the back of the car, the angle to reflection shot in the windshield, the depth shot through the trees, the angled shot from the side, which is also low, depth shot from the distance, wide reflection shot in the mirror, low shot on Joe, point of view shot from the front of the truck, linking shot from the truck to the sign, very low shot of the truck, opposite high position from the cabin, depth shot as the truck goes by to the cabin. Whenever you can, you should try to incorporate the pedestal shot into your video work. Broadcast professionals use this all the time. Simply holding the camera, usually at wide, and going up, or in this case, going down. It also can be used as a linking shot. This is used all the time in broadcast television, and you should be using it on your jobs. Using pedestal shots is a sign of a true pro. Most pedestal shots go from position 1 to 3 or 4, or 3 or 4 down to 1. One secret of the broadcast professionals is leaves. They use leaves and trees and different things for foreground because it adds the depth of field to the shot. Now, the big secret is that they don't always use something that's naturally around them, like this. We're using something like this in front of the camera now to give us that frame. As a matter of fact, Joe can pull it away right now or he could put it back. Instant framing. You see, before and after can make a big difference in many shots. I recommend if you're in an area where you add to, ha have to add framing, to look around and see if there's something like this. I also recommend going to a store that sells fake plants and flowers and grabbing a few of these things to keep in your car in that situation when you need that instant depth, when you want to frame the shot and add a lot of perspective. Either that or go off to a place that has a few plants around, take a branch off a tree, and add instant framing. An interesting thing happened back in the mid-1980s. The independent small videographer that didn't have a big budget was finally able to get big budget techniques using things like the video toaster and the AVE5, MX50, MX1 mixers. When these mixers came along and special effects devices, they allowed the small guy to do what the big guy was doing. The big guys, though, had one over on the small guys because as soon as all the little guys were able to start doing those big guy kind of effects, the big guys stopped using those effects. As a matter of fact, if you watch television now, they're going back to all the effects that were the basics of the industry from the film days way back when. Those are basic dissolves, fade to black. They're even using a lot of titles now that are simply white letters on a black background. So this is why good advanced camera technique is more important than ever, because good advanced camera technique does not go out of style. Certain effects go out of style, certain kinds of titling goes out of style, but good solid camera work does not go out of style. As digital video becomes more and more prevalent, we're also seeing the proliferation of the top broadcasters 
actually dumbing down their signal. They're taking commercials and making them black and white. They're making them grainy. They're making them shaky. They're tinting them yellow. They're doing all sorts of crazy things to separate themselves from the small independent videographer who's actually getting the sharper and sharper equipment. So remember, what it boils down to is good, solid camera work, and you can't go wrong. The up the body shot simply involves starting at the bottom and moving up from position one to four shown here with your camcorder. It's done on broadcast television all the time. You can use a tripod or you can do it freehand. For most situations you want to get the subject's permission before doing the up the body shot. Most videographers have seen this shot and know about the shot, but it's surprising how few use it. So on your next job, use the up the body shot. At a gathering after memorial service, we decided to use a window shot to get another perspective on this scene. Broadcasters know the value of window shots and use these opposite type of shots whenever possible. On your next job, look around for windows and see if there's some place you can incorporate the window shot in your videotaping. Please remember that zooming in is not the same as moving in. When you zoom in from a distance, you can get things, but you're limiting the depth of field. You're also limiting perspective. That is that angle that you can get between the object at the side of you and the object right in front of you. So whenever you can, I always tell camera people when I'm training them to keep the camera on the wide position and move in whenever they can. If you're doing a wedding or some speech where you can't get in, that's different. But, if you're in a situation when you can get closer, it can make all the difference in the world. Here's a local TV crew. Notice how close they get. Here's a shot with the camera zoomed in from the distance. Here's the same shot with the camera up close. Many videographers have the mistaken impression that getting close will ruin the mood of the subject, so they just zoom in from afar. Top broadcast professionals, whenever possible, have the camera lens on wide and move in instead. They know the secrets of getting close without distraction. My friend and expert cameraman Joe Correa explains this best. When you talk about blending with people, uh, there is a difference between blending with people and mangling with bodies. When, when you deal with people, you're dealing with personalities. And the bodies are just a vehicle through with which people travel around. So if you feel comfortable with people, you can be right in the middle of them. And it's fine. If you don't feel comfortable, if you feel that you are obtrusive, you will be obtrusive because that attitude will reflect and people will feel as uncomfortable so, with you. So how do you feel comfortable? What if, what if you say as a videographer, well, I'm just not comfortable getting close to people, so I'm going to stand in the back. You well, it sounds a little bit like me that you can be the background videographer and do okay. I mean, look, we have many of those that make a living from the back of the room. But if you want to be more than that, you know, it's like saying, uh, I, don't, I don't mind fish, but I'm not going to be fishing. Now, you, you got to get out there where the action is, and you have to be part of it. You have to open your heart to, to what's going on, to be a part of the action, to like people, to get involved with them, and then be sensitive to their needs. Some people need more space. And as you get closer to a person, you after a while know how close you can get before you begin to invade their space and they feel uncomfortable. So it's kind of a dance. It's, it's like anything else. When, when you go out on a date the first time, you just kind of... You know, check the water, see how close you can get without, you know, being rejected. Well, in a group of people, it's pretty much the same. And the answer lies within you. Just be loose, relax, go in there and uh, get what you need and immediately go somewhere else. I uh, Sometimes I have nowhere to go. But in the moment I catch that moment, I'm out of there. And I go somewhere else even if I don't have nowhere to go. The reason for that is gives the people the feeling of comfort that you're not hanging on them that you're just capturing moments and that they were important on some at some moment and so therefore you're not invading on anybody's space at any one time but you everywhere all the time and all of a sudden the other people that see you 
being close to that person, they want to be just as important. So they are going to be more receptive to the opportunity. So within half an hour of being in a public event, people like to see me get close to them because they feel, oh, you know, he noticed me. So it, all of a sudden it's a reversal. People want you close because that's a form of approval. Now I'm using Joe as a subject here. If anybody saw the movie Jaws, they saw a shot where the person all of a sudden sees the shark coming toward them and the background changes. We're going to show you how to do that. And we in invite you as a humorous thing to use this in something that you do sometime. We have the neutral density filter on. We zoom in really tight and we notice the background is a little bit fuzzy. Now Joe is framed from about his shoulders to the top of his head. And if we can almost recreate that shot from Jaws as we walk in and we pull back at the same time and Joe acts surprised. <laughs> there you go. Whoa. Now we're going to try that again. Again, remember what I said, practice. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to zoom in real close. And we're doing this handheld. You could do this with a, a dolly if you wanted to. And you're looking out, Joe, and you're seeing that there's some shark coming in. All of a sudden you're getting surprised, surprised, and more surprised, shocked. Huh. Okay, we'll try it one more time again. And basically you do this till you get it right until it looks really nice, okay? There's the shot in him. He's looking out over the ocean. All of a sudden, he looks startled. Uh oh, shots. There we go. Here's some more examples of the Jaws shot. Try to remember to practice this one. I'll do it on a job because using it can be very difficult. In this particular example, the tray almost seems to come toward the screen when, in fact, nothing whatsoever is moving except the camera and the zoom on the lens. We used the back of a car going in reverse to get this shot, and we even tried it in the other direction. In my hand, I have a big camera, but I also use small cameras. It's important to remember on this video, it doesn't matter what camera you're using, the same shots apply. And one shot that you really should consider doing is when you're framing your foreground, look at what your background is and see if you can tell two stories in one shot. In a way, this is a linking shot because I define a linking shot as any shot that is telling two stories with the same shot. But in this one, there's no movement. You see this on broadcast see a shot in the foreground and then if you notice carefully in the background something else related to the story is going on in the background and you know what coincidentally it's right in frame now was that just an accident i think not the camera person was smart enough to either position himself so when he's looking and getting the foreground with the background he's moving around or he's smart enough to go to the foreground people and, or the foreground thing and move it in, into place and say, can you just sit there or can you move there or actually move it if it's an inanimate object to get the background or the camera person just tells the foreground to stay still, goes to the background and asks, either physically moves the background if it's inanimate or ask the people, would you just sit over here? Can you move that flagpole over here? Can you do that? And then he goes back or she goes back and videotapes the foreground with that thing happening in the background. So when you watch broadcast television tonight, you're gonna see this happen again and again and again. You're gonna see that background shot that happens to be just coincidentally in the same frame. That separates a regular camera person from a broadcast camera person. A broadcast camera person, and in as many shots as possible, and it's not possible in every one, looks for a shot where the foreground tells the story, but the background backs up that same story. Sometime in your video career, you'll probably be videotaping a band. Now, too many videographers set up their cameras and then worry about a clear shot once the band begins to play. The secret of videotaping bands, though, is you taking control as the videographer and positioning the mic stands before the band starts. As you'll notice in this video, no matter what shot we cut to, you can see all the different band people. This is because before the band started, we positioned the mic stand so nobody would be blocked. Also, we're using three cameras here. This camera is a low angle. We recommend if you're going to use multiple cameras when videotaping a band, that one of them get a lower angle for some nice perspective. 
Just to review, you want to position the mic stands before the band begins its set. You want to position your camera so you get different angles like you see here. And you also may want to consider occasionally doing a zoom in, which normally we don't recommend, but it's all the rage with music videos. If you do a zoom in, it's a good idea to cut to the next shot before the zoom end finishes. One way I got really good at camera technique is I actually met up with a cameraman and he allowed me to follow him around in the job. I did this numerous times and it got me very, very good at camera technique. And all you have to do is go down to a local station where, and you ask who's the best camera person in, at, the, at the station. Or you just check around and find someone who's a really dynamic go-getter camera person and say, would you mind if, you, if I can watch you do some of your camera work or you could show me some technique? This way you can be surprised at how fast you can improve your camera technique by simply mentoring with somebody who is really good at camera technique. It really worked for me years back and I still do it today. I can always learn award-winning cameramen out there and camera women know that there's always another shot to get. There's an, always another thing that they can learn. So they network. Don't be afraid to find somebody who's working for a television station or who has a video production business and is just known as the best in the area to ask that person, can you hang out with them and, and have them show you, you know, what they do. Most people that are up at that level do not mind sharing at all their secrets because they know that if the whole industry is brought up, it's better for everybody. Ten years ago, I got good by following around my mentor, broadcast cameraman and now producer, Dave Ferry. The people around you are the ones that are going to train you. You know, the, the veteran cameraman next to you on the other camera in the news studio who's been doing it for, for 15, 20, 30 years is the person that's your best friend right then and there. Because they're going to, if you approach them right, and you're willing to learn from them, you know, not, well, hey, this should be easy, this shouldn't be any ah. problem. I mean, that person's been doing it for 30 years, and they take a lot of pride in what they're doing. And you need to understand that, and you need, they're your best friend if you're willing to learn from them. And they're willing to teach you. And, the, and most of the times, the way they're going to be willing to teach you is if you're willing to learn and you show a little respect towards their craft and, and say, wow, man, that was, that was a great zoom or that was a great pedestal move. You know, how do you do that? Yeah. I like low angle shots. I think it's because we, it's, uh, you know, we, we see through our eyes and depending on your height between five and six feet, that's your frame of reference. You get that camera down on the floor and look up a little bit. It shows you a whole different perspective. Or, you know, uh, things are oriented towards our eye level, five or six feet. Mm -hmm. So you see a lot from, from down low. You just see it at a different angle. And sometimes you can get some real interesting shots. You get that camera off your shoulder or get it off the tripod and, you know, get it a little lower. Most of the work that I've done has been purely the technical side. So I've always had a producer or a reporter asking the questions. But the reporters that I've always respected the most the, are the ones that they know what kind of an answer they want going into the interview. They know the questions that they need answered. And if that person doesn't answer that question the first time around or doesn't specifically doesn't answer it the way that they want it, uh -huh. they'll ask it a hundred different ways until they get the answer that they want that, you know, and they'll phrase it so many different ways manipulating the story i mean how, where do you draw the line there it, it, well it's 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 your code of ethics yeah. it is manipulating the story if you're trying to put words into the person's mouth it isn't manipulating it if the person stumbled through the answer the first time and the second time and the third time and you're trying to get them to say it in a coherent way. Um, a good producer, a good reporter has already done a lot of background, talked to this person over the phone before they got there, understands their side of the story, and is just trying to do, the, their job now is to get that person who is not used to being in, on camera, who is a little nervous, to, to tell the story the way they told it to him over the phone when they first talked to them.
You remember earlier we talked about Waldo, the wide, the angle, the low, the linking, the depth, and the opposite. Well, I like a lot of opposites, things that you don't always expect. A point of view shot that's an opposite shot that I like is called the insider shot. Now an insider shot is also used by broadcast camera people all around the world. You can either fake an insider shot or make it real. Example, an insider shot would be opening refrigerator. You, you need a small camera to put in there. Uh, another insider shot would be opening the mailbox. Another insider shot would be someone loading up the car with the camera inside. You can do these for real by putting a camera in the refrigerator. If your camera is too big, you might have to simulate or to simulate the inside of a can or something. But it's a really advanced shot and that it's not used that often. But when it is used and it's used right, it really gives you a perspective from that subject's point of view. Now keep in mind that when we say subject, that doesn't necessarily have to be a person. That can be an inanimate object. The important thing about insider shots is they take you from the outside to the inside to give you a different perspective. The best way to understand insider shots is just to show you them so you can understand what we're talking about and how they can relate to the work that you do. Broadcast camera people have a secret that most amateur beginning professionals do not realize, and that is the high angle shot. Now everybody knows high angle shot, you just get up and get a high angle shot, but where do you get one from? You know, when the broadcast pros go out on a job, the first thing that they do is scout out different angles, and one of those angles is looking for where they can get that overhead God's eye view to give you the beautiful perspective, the beautiful depth. And most people think, well, there's no place for me to go, but if you look carefully, there's always a ladder or a hill or a tree branch you can climb up on, don't get yourself hurt, of course, or there's a balcony, or there's steps, or there's a porch, or there's some place you can go up and get that high angle. The secret is to become aware that you have to get it and look around. And you're going to find at 80% of the jobs, there's some place you can go to get that high angle. Even if it's the top of a building, always look for where you can get that high angle shot. It might be the top of an escalator. It might be the top of a ladder. But they're out there. They're all over the place. And broadcast professionals are using this on television every night of the week. Tonight, I want you to watch television and actually look for where they're using that high angle shot. And when you realize how often it's used, you'll start using it. The only way to really use it though, is to look around on where you get to the job site and find what particular place there is where you can get that high angle shot. And even if you just use it once, it adds a lot to the beauty of the images you're trying to create. And it makes a two dimensional image a little bit more three dimensional image by giving that establishing overhead God's eye view. Videography is the only art form I know where part of your job is to get paid to watch TV. Watching TV is an integral part of what you do because it allows you to see different trends. You know, if I had thought when I was a child that I'd have a job where part of my job was getting paid to watch TV, I would have thought they were crazy. And now I'm living that dream. Watching TV is so important because trends happen and you want to be up on those trends. For example, humor is becoming more and more part of video simply because on television, the remote control has made people want to flip by commercials. Now, as a result, commercials are adding more and more humor and telling more and more in story and getting more and more fast cuts to try to keep your attention. They're doing everything from making everything look grainy to making things look out of focus. But mainly, the trend these days is to try to make it funny and entertaining to tell a story. So you want to watch the commercial as a story. Now, how does that relate to you as a videographer? What you may want to do is to start adding a little bit more humor, adding a little bit more fast pace, trying to tell little stories and different things you do based on what you see on TV. And of course, the other great thing about watching TV, the main reason is you take your pen or pencil and a notepad and you jot down all those things you're seeing that these professional videographers are doing that you might not be doing. And even if you are doing some of them, isn't it great to get a reminder sometime of, oh, I haven't done that shot in a while. Many of you 
remember the days of tube cameras when it was considered taboo to point your lens into the sun. These days with chip cameras, nobody has to worry about that. And that's why broadcasters every night on television are doing shots where the sun peers into the foreground right past the subject. If you want to be a top videographer, you must add this shot to your list. It won't hurt your camera and will add a nice touch to the work that you do. This is best done before 10 a.m. or after 3 p.m. As you'll notice, the background is out of focus. And there's a reason for that. Because Joe, our cameraman, zoomed in really pretty tight, used a neutral density filter, and then just focused in on me, making sure the background's way in the distance. This is nice because it brings your subject out. It makes your subject solely to the center of attention and adds a nice muted background. This soft background is the same setup as the rack focus, except you're not moving the focus ring. So I want you to try this at your next job. Make a little note card that says, try soft focus interview. So if you're getting an interview of someone or you're getting a shot of somebody, have them stand someplace. Make sure the background's way in the distance. If you can use a neutral density filter, focus in on your subject and you'll get that nice, pleasing, soft background. Another one of my favorite point of view shots is what I call the frisbee shot. This can be done with a computer disc, it can be done with a frisbee, it can be done with a biscuit. All it involves is putting the subject in front of your lens, but not touching your lens, you don't want to hurt it, walking with the camera and bringing the subject to its destination. Again, you could do this with a frisbee, you can do this with a software disc, you can do this with a piece of food. It's really dramatic and it adds a little bit of humor to your video shot. This is a shot that's not done much at all by your average videographer, but when you do add it to your arsenal of tricks, it will greatly increase the different types of shots you're doing. Every so often a videographer comes by our office and lets us know that they're available to shoot. So what I usually do is, if I like the person, I hand them the, the camera, a small camera temporarily, and say, would you go over and just shoot that person at the desk? Get a few different shots from a few different angles so I can see what kind of a camera person you are. This usually takes them off guard, but they do it anyway. And what I look for when they play back is different things. The amateur videographer, or the person with not a lot of experience, will do a couple pans, a couple different angles, medium shots. The person who's really good, and I've yet to see come in my office, will do the following. They'll shoot the person from a wide shot. They'll also get a shot from behind the computer, giving some depth of field to the person at the computer. They'll get a shot over the shoulder into the computer screen. And if they're even more creative, they'll rack focus between the computer screen and the reflection of that person. They'll also maybe get an overhead shot. They'll get a very low angle shot. And they'll put the camera on the desk getting the papers in the foreground to get that low, low angle shot right from the desk. They also might walk out the door, get a shot through the window, or back up and get a shot using the door frame as framing a depth of field for the person working at the computer. Now, if I see this, I know I have a very good camera person. And this is a technique that you can use to check out camera people that come in your door. It's very simple. All these techniques that I just described are things that broadcast people use every day. The top camera people in the country use them. And there's no reason that you can't use them. There's no license that you have to have to use them. There's no test you have to take to use these. These are available every day. You see them on television. All they require is you to carry a shot list with you and for you to practice these things. So if somebody hands you a camera someday and says videotape that person at that computer desk, you can do all those different kind of angles and they can say, wow. That person knows their stuff. I am constantly amazed at the number of people that call themselves professional, yet they don't know anything about foreground framing.
Here's a shot of a fire without foreground framing. There's no depth of field, yet this next shot we're going to see here is raw footage of Joe getting in position here, and he puts the policeman in the foreground to add some framing and some depth to the shot of the fire and the shot of the water going toward the fire. As you can see, even the walkie-talkie adds a little bit of foreground framing. Let's go on to a couple other shots. Here you have the hoses in the ground as the foreground framing. Here you have a pole to the side as foreground framing. Just about anything can be used as foreground framing. If you watch TV tonight, you'll notice broadcasters use foreground framing all the time because it adds a little bit more three-dimensionality to the two-dimensionality of a TV screen. Here you have the water falling. Here you have the leaves. Both is foreground framing. You have a mic stand. You have a sign. You have another sign here. All foreground framing elements. When you're out on the job, whether it's an Elmer's glue bottle or it's a painter's canvas, you have to look around for things that are going to be foreground framing. Again, if you watch television tonight, you'll notice the broadcasters use this kind of framing all the time to add a sense of depth to their picture. Even people like these two ladies are foreground framing for the rest of the picture. Foreground framing is used all the time on broadcast TV. In your next job, make sure you try to incorporate some kind of foreground framing that you haven't been using in the past. I love going to movies because you can learn so much about camera technique. Movies have some of the best cinematographers in the country working for them, and they do some shots that sometimes I never think of, and yet when I see, I either try to write it down or I try to memorize it. A couple years ago, my wife and I were watching a movie called Junior with Danny DeVito and Arnold Schwarzenegger, and we saw a great shot where the subject comes right toward the screen, disappears into the black of the person, and then out the other side of the person as they walk on by. It was a fabulous shot, and since I watched that shot at the movies, I've been able to apply it to a few different jobs I do. So next time you're at the movies, please, please, watch the different camera shots and walk away with one shot that you'll be able to use on your next job. One great way to get the techniques you've learned on this video ingrained in you is to teach them to other people by holding a class. This is me about eight years ago when I used to teach an adult education series called Camcorder Class. I not only refresh my own skills, I got paid to do it. Here I get a volunteer from the class to demonstrate how to videotape okay. young now, children. Now, pretend Helga is the two-year-old for this part, and I am the mother of the father. With the camera. Now, where do two-year-olds sit or stand? On the floor, right? Have a seat right there. Trust me. Have a seat. She's like, oh my God, why did I take this course? Okay, so here's your two-year-old on the floor, right? Along comes Uncle Joe with the camera. And what happens is the two-year-old is on the floor, and I decide I'm going to film my two-year-old. So what do I do? I walk up to the two-year-old, and I do this. How does this make you feel? How does it make you feel, really? Well, I'm going to run away. Really uncomfortable, right? Now, see if you're a two-year-old, now watch the same thing. I do this because I, I want you to understand how your child feels with this big person around. Now watch the same thing. I'm going to take the viewfinder, flip it upwards, get down on baby Helga's level, okay? And I'm going to push the pause button. I'm going to tilt up my viewfinder. If you have one of those others, you tilt up a little. And I'm going to film from here. How does this make you feel? A little bit more comfortable, right? A little bit more comfortable. And for young kids, it's very important not to film like this because you're going to get the top of their head. And for me, that's a bald spot, okay? So for a young, a young child, it's just very intimidating and, and you don't get really their facial expressions and everything. Whereas if you're down here where the child is and you have to squint your, squint your eye down here or you can tilt up your viewfinder if you have one of those, you're going to get some of the best pictures and the kid's going to crawl over and want to drool on the lens, okay? But you just pull it right back at the time. You can even watch the child and look in your viewfinder. That is like the big secret. Put my lens as wide as possible and I have them sort of like this and tilt it from the ground and they'll crawl right up but you got some beautiful pictures and uh, some people when I've done professional film, oh you got great kids, the baby, shots of the baby. All I've done is really been down here near the floor. Let's give baby Helga a round of applause. <laughs> The twister simply involves a short shot where your camcorder starts at an angle slightly zoomed in and twists as you pull back. 
The end of the shot is where the picture levels out, or sometime after that. If this shot is done with speed and accuracy, it will not look like a mistake. However, do not overuse this shot as it can get the viewer dizzy. It should be done when you're relatively close to the subject and only when you're comfortable with this shot. This move is associated with youth since its origins are in music videos and it's to be used sparingly only if you're comfortable with its look. Let's take a look at the right way and the wrong way to do commercials. First, let's see the wrong way. The Student Art Guild of Garland Community College presents the annual project that everyone gets involved in. It's the Old Car Penny Gluing Day. Be part of an art project everyone will see. The gluing takes place 10 a.m. through 6 p.m. this Saturday, May 6th at Arlington Park. You bring the pennies, we'll supply the glue. Help turn an old Chevy into a Lincoln. Come just to watch, come to have fun. That's this Saturday, 10 through 6, Arlington Park. Now let's look at the same commercial, this time using some advanced techniques that we've learned about in this video. The Student Art Guild of Garland Community College presents the annual project that everyone gets involved in. It's the Old Car Penny Gluing Day. Be part of an art project everyone will see. The gluing takes place 10 a.m. through 6 p.m. this Saturday, May 6th at Arlington Park. You bring the pennies, we'll supply the glue. Help turn an old Chevy into a Lincoln. Come just to watch, come to have fun. That's this Saturday, 10 through 6, Arlington Park. Please take this time to watch the commercial again and review what types of shots were used. This is one shot I can almost guarantee you're not doing now, but advanced broadcasters do it every night on television. It's the ground walkover shot. It simply involves putting your camera on the ground and giving instructions to your subjects to walk on either side or one side of the camera that's on the ground. You can have them walk away from the camera or toward the camera. It's used on television every night and it's a classic shot that you can use to improve your camera work. You don't even have to do it with a subject walking or running. It could be done with a set of bicycles going along the road, or it can be done with a group of people walking upstairs. Practice it, try it, write it on your shot list, and use it on your next job. In my job, I talk to videographers from all over the country. A lot of them send me tapes. It's not bad camera work, it's just mediocre camera work. When I ask them why they're not expanding their camera work and why they're not doing these other creative things, they usually give me three or four responses. First response is, well, I use a tripod and I have a very good one. Now, we all know that a tripod limits you in the amount of created shots. It limits you in the amount that you're able to get around. Tripods are very important as a tool and where they are necessary. Like, for instance, in a situation where any movement whatsoever from the camera part is going to disturb the viewer from the story, like an interview with President Clinton. You don't want that camera to move at all. You want it to be solid because the full attention should be on a subject. But when you are living, when you are capturing an action that is fluid, that is constantly changing like a group of people, you, the best shots are taken with handheld cameras simply because you never know what's going to happen next but you have to be prepared. Also gives you the opportunity to have wide-angle lenses that allow you to come in very close and increase the perspective which are always very dynamic and very emotional, very strong. You always can back up and go into a telephoto and capture a personality, a moment there where there is a beautiful face, the lighting is just right. But if every shot you have is from a tripod, you cannot be changing the tripod to have a ground shot, a high shot, a movement. You anchored to that one point. So what you're saying is that shooting at an entire event from one point on a tripod is like trying to compose a whole orchestration with one note. I don't think it's the easiest way to do it. The second excuse that they use is, well, I'm self-taught or I have my own style. Well, that's almost like a writer saying that they use their own alphabet. 
All the different styles come from a combination of things that we've picked up all different places. The same with music, the same with many different art forms. Sure, you can have your own style, but it's a combination of different things. And so to just simply say I have my own style, if your own style is just average, that's not going to cut it in the future of videography. The third thing people say is that, well, I don't get any complaints, my customers seem to like my work. My response to that is, if you go to a McDonald's or some fast food restaurant, you don't hear many complaints either, because the expectation isn't that high. Many of those customers may not just call you back. They may just go get someone else, or someone else may come by and look at the tape that you've done and look at somebody else's and hire someone else instead of you. Why would they do that? Because you are not as creative as the next guy. Now that other guy who's being creative doesn't cost them any more money, doesn't cost them any more equipment, it just costs them the ability to think on the job, the ability to bring a shot list, and the ability to practice when they're not on the job. Before going any further in this tape, please stop and review the rule of thirds that you see here. The rule of thirds involves mentally dividing your viewfinder up like a tic-tac-toe board and framing your shot so the important elements of the shot fall on the lines or where the lines intersect. Broadcast professionals are very aware of the rule of thirds and use it to its utmost potential. Let's take a look at how it applies to an interview situation. Position the eye that is closest to the edge of the screen at or slightly below one of the two upper intersecting points. Now let's look at examples that will make this rule easier to understand. Let's look at an example of someone being interviewed and superimpose the tic-tac-toe board. You see the circle which represents the area that the eye usually falls in. It's either at or below the intersecting point. This will become natural to you the more interviews you do and you will naturally instinctively place the outer eye at or below that intersecting point. Keep in mind that this is only a rule, and rules of course are occasionally meant to be broken, but it's a nice guideline to get you started when you're doing interviews. Most videographers know that videotaping a sign at an angle can give you better depth and better perspective. But very few videographers know about this little known black belt technique that you can try in your next job. Either walk back or pull back from beyond the sign, ending the shot by finally revealing the full sign. Okay, your homework tonight is to watch the last story on the Evening Network News. The last story on these news shows is usually a fun feature story where the broadcast camera people get to show off some of their best technique. If you get a pen and you get some paper and you jot it down, you're going to notice many of these shots fall into the wide, angled, low, linking, depth, and opposite shots. Also, you're going to pick up some ideas that you never thought of before and you're going to be able to apply these. So watch the news tonight, watch that last story, which is usually the feature story, usually a fun one, and notice all the creative shots that they're using that you're not using now, but you'll be using in the future. Walk towards me, slowly, and walk right past me. Just walk, uh, walk right by me as if I'm not here. And action. I called this morning and they said it's the cabin. Ready? And action. Yeah. Good. Don't be afraid to set up shots. 
And what I mean by setting up shots is just arranging people in a way to make your camera shot a little bit better. You can't spend days trying to get some of these shots. you got to get them then. So if that means taking somebody and moving them to left or right so the sun's peering through or so they're lined up and somebody's in the background, that's okay. Do you know on broadcast television, they do this all the time. The cameraman is constantly saying, all right, just move a little to the left. Okay, walk over here, do this. And yet a lot of videographers think, well, I can't set it up, then I'm ruining the mood. Not at all. You just got to go over to them and say, hey, look, I need you to do me a little favor. Just move over here. If you could just sit here, you do something like that. And you would be surprised how having someone just move a little bit for your shot will be really helpful. As a matter of fact, you know, photographers do this all the time. They're constantly setting up shots. And we feel as videographers sometimes that if we have to do that, it's taboo. We're not getting people in the moment. But you have to understand that it's normal to set up shots and it's okay to set up shots because when you do it, and people see the video after, they don't remember, oh, that guy moved me a little bit to the left, or that guy moved me to the right. They remember the good shot. Keep, keep looking toward the car for me. Just keep looking at the car. Just reach your hand in that bucket and get some of the pennies out. Now, go ahead, reach your hand take them out. Great. Thank you. Okay. Keep doing what you're doing. I'm going to get a shot from down here. Just be looking out that way. Don't Just ignore me. Pretend I'm not here. Would you just uh, stand right where you're standing? I need to add some depth to the shot. Okay. And if you move out of the shot, there's nobody looking at it and okay. it doesn't look as good. I'm stand right next to him. <laughs> yeah, now there's no audio in this, so you could say whatever you want. <laughs> okay, just be a little closer together. It'd be great. Act like you love each other. There you go. <laughs> now that's a little too close. Okay. Did you get some depth here? That's right, great. Just it'll take a second longer. Look at the eyes. Man, that's great. Wow, you guys were fabulous. Thank you. Look sort of up a bit toward the sky. Keep going up. I know it's hard because of the light. I mean, but see, I promised you a breeze. There we go. Give me a smile. That's nice. Nice smile. There we go. It's hard, but we're getting some air conditioning here. Now look at the keyboard, please. I mean, look at the uh, monitor. I'm sorry. There we go. Smile. Give me a nice smile. Oh, fantastic. One advanced technique that wouldn't seem like an advanced technique is actually to make the camera look like it was done by an amateur. And that's simply done by zooming in and out with the camera, moving it around a little bit, and tilting 45 degrees back and forth, left and right. It's actually a skill to do that when you're a real advanced professional, but it can give that whole movie look you've been wanting. Most videographers know about the use of cutaway shots for maximum impact. But many do not know that using four or more cutaways in a row can make your video more suspenseful, help build anticipation, or adding them in a row together can have the same emotional impact as one point of view shot. You can edit these cutaways in camera or you could put them all together in a row in post-production. Either way, the next time you're covering an event, try to get as many cutaways as possible and then see how powerful they are when you edit them together as a group. For these next specialty shots, we definitely recommend a tripod. The first one is the scenery transition where you zoom in on a person's face, cut into the close-up and when they pull back, they are in an entirely different location. This is just done with straight cuts editing, like with the blue sky transition. Same kind of thing, you start out on an object, and then you zoom in instead of to a person's face into the sky. When the pullback is done, you're in an entirely different location. We're gonna see that again, only this time without a wide angle lens. Same kind of effect, go up to the sky. When you pull back, you're in a different location. This could be dissolved with a digital mixer, but all these were done with straight cuts. The next transition is the whip pan transition. Simply take your tripod, lock it on a scene, and then what you're gonna do with the tripod handle is spin the tripod handle away from the object and end up at another scene. Now we're gonna show you how we did this by breaking it down in slow motion. We start with the first scene, and remember, this takes a few different practices. We whip the tripod. You'll notice right here, it cuts to a different shade of green. Back up again, and you'll notice as we go forward, there's the different green of the new scene where we whipped into the scene. And whipping into the scene takes a little bit more practice to land on your subject matter. And as you can see, as the tripod slows down, the scene comes in clearer, 
and you've landed on your second part of the transition. Let's see this one again. That's all there is to it. The next transition is called the focus transition. This involves taking a scene and actually putting your camera out of focus on purpose at the end of the scene and remembering to also get another similar scene where you come in from out of focus. When you get to a job site, if by chance you forgot your shot list and you happen to be lacking creativity that day, don't panic. First of all, remember Waldo. Your wide, angled, low, linking, depth, and opposite shots. Secondly, think of the five camera positions and how you could use them with the situation at hand. You don't have to just have the camcorder on your shoulder. Third of all, if you have to remember one concept from this video when you're out on the job, try to remember the concept of foreground framing that we discussed in chapter 35. Foreground framing is so important for adding that extra dimension to your videos. If the idea of foreground framing can become automatic to you, so many of the other techniques we talked about in this video will fall right into place. Finally, remember that TV is a close-up medium. Do what the broadcasters do and get more close-ups than you think you need because this gives your camera work maximum impact. You know one of the fabulous things about this video is after you've completed it, and after you've practiced, practiced, practiced all the different shots or most of the shots in this video, I know well, you'll feel confident that if a major network called you and said, we need you to shoot something, you would feel comfortable doing it. You would feel proud from the time that you handed them that tape that what you gave them with the wide shots, with the angled shots, with the low shots, with the linking shots, with the depth shots, with the opposites, was 99% of what their national broadcast camera people do. And that should be a feeling that you are proud of because most videographers out there are just average. They're just mediocre and even worse, they think they're pretty good. The problem with the videographers thinking they're pretty good is they stop learning. The award-winning professionals know you can never stop learning. I appreciate you joining us today, and I hope that you'll go out there and practice all the techniques that you've seen on this tape. I'm sure there are some that you might be doing that we didn't show on this tape. Perhaps we'll show them on another video. In the meantime, we look forward to seeing you on a new video, and if you have any particular shots that you'd like to share with us, feel free to send them in to us. Also, if you've done shots that you're not doing before that you saw in this video that made a big difference in your camera technique, feel free to send those to us. We'd love to see them. We'd love to hear your success stories. I got to get going. Thanks for joining us today. I'll see you again soon.
Hi, sorry I couldn't meet with you in person, but I figure videotape would be the next best way. Thanks for putting in the videotape because I really want to show you all the great things the BVP4 Plus can do for any video signal. Now, it really works well with the digital video camcorders because the signal's so clean to begin with, but it'll work with any video source. The reason it's so great is because it's not a processing amplifier. It's not your normal video proc amp. It actually does a lot more. We're not only going to explain what it does and how it does, we're actually going to show you. So without any further ado, I'd like to um, show you some before and after footage. What you see here is some footage right from the Sony DXV1000 camcorder. It looks fine. There's no problem with it at all. The question is, can you make it better? And the answer is yes. So right now I'm going to stop the edit for a minute and put this footage directly through the BVP4 Plus. Okay, right now here's the beginning footage again. This time it's going through the BVP4 Plus. I'm going to freeze it for a minute. Now, it doesn't look much different because I haven't turned the split screen over. Now, watch the difference as I turn the split screen over. It's sort of hard to believe the difference in footage. I'll put it on slow motion here. I'm going to tell you what we did to get a better signal. First of all, we have a thing called color level here. Now, most color levels on proc amps boost it so much that it adds noise to the signal. The BVP4 Plus is the first a processor out that has a super saturation. That's why you're able to get that rich color. Now if you go up too much, it's going to overdo it like right there. You really don't want to do that. And as a matter of fact, you can still adjust your green any way you want or any colors you want. But the color level on the BVP4 Plus has a super saturation circuit. And with the digital camcorders, they can't put all the color information you'd really want in there because of the fact that they have to limit the amount of bits and bytes they put on a tape. Here's another example from the Sony camcorder, the digital. As you can see, it's just about even right now, but we're going to make it better. The right is going to be the improved side, the left is the before side, and all we have to do to make it better, first of all, is bring up the point-to-point -point luminance, which gives you a brighter picture without washout. You see the black to the right we got to make a little bit blacker, so we're going to turn down the IRE just about two notches. We're going to get a blacker signal. Now the flesh tone's a little bit red, so we're going to turn that so it's a little bit more closer to flesh tone. And then we're going to boost, remember the super saturation color that we talked about, to give you more color than actually the tape is giving you without adding the distortion. Now I'm going to turn on the black restore, and you're going to see as I flick it on and off how it affects the black background without affecting the whites of the picture. I'm just going to add a bit of that and then I'm going to do my before and after comparison and you'll notice even on the lights, the Christmas tree lights to the right and the left, the difference you get the whites look whiter, the blacks look back blacker and the super saturation color level is giving you a little more then I can also play with the resolution boost and um, bring up a little bit resolution boost so overall you get a sharper brighter picture with richer color Sometimes this can happen. This is with the Sony digital camcorder. Outside you get a little bit of reds or sometimes you get red in the skin tone. We're using a combination of point-to-point -point luminance here along with the reduction in color level and the flesh tone to give you that better flesh tone. I can let it run for a minute here. You can see if I freeze this shot, look at the difference. We can bring, by using the flesh tone control only found on the BVP4 Plus, reduction in color level and an increase in point-to-point -point luminance, the dynamic range expansion, how you get something that normally wouldn't transfer that great to VHS like this and bring it over to there and it'll transfer a lot better. Here's a direct digital firewire transfer and here's the same footage to the BVP4 Plus. Once again, direct digital firewire transfer here and now here through the BVP4 Plus. Here's another example, direct digital and now through the BVP4 Plus. At this point, you might be saying, whoa, this looks too good to be true. I guarantee you it's not. As a matter of fact, to prove it right now, we're going to do a split screen test where we take the image from right here and go into a splitter, I should say a distribution amp, a YC distribution amp, and into two channels of a digital video mixer that has split screen so you can actually see the improvement with a split screen other than the BVP4 Plus split screen. Let's see that right now. Here's lovely Annie with none of her image going through the BVP4. We're using the split screen from a Panasonic AV55 mixer. This is before, this is after. Once again, before, after. You could do it either way here. And I'm moving the split screen back and forth. You can even diff do different split screen patterns on this. And in no way is this signal you're, you're seeing here going through the BVP4 Plus 
This is the signal going through the BVP4+. Plus. They've been split through a distribution amplifier. So as you can see, it makes a big difference. If you're not using the BVP4+, Plus, you don't get the advantage of the supersaturation, the flesh tone, the point-to-point -point luminance, and the resolution boost. And this is why you get this kind of signal. Back to the Sony camcorder again. Here's an example of the flesh tone. You can see how it improves the flesh tone in combination with the point-to-point -point luminance. Okay, let's take a look at some flesh tone restore here, but we also have black restore. And as you notice, that can affect the darkness of the hair and make a real nice edging and a real big improvement to the picture. Here we use black restore on the tuxedos. Note how the resolution boost makes the edges of the grass look a lot sharper. Here's an overall improvement on a close-up of a fire. Here's an improvement in a somewhat backlit situation. We use the color level and the point-to-point -point luminance to bring out the sky a lot more. Generally speaking, the more colors you have in your shot, the more that the BVP4 can do to make a better picture. So right now you're wondering, how can this unit be better than any other processor on the market? Well, I'm going to tell you some of the secrets behind the BVP4+. Plus. First of all, the color level, again, as we talked about before, is that super saturation, so you can get more color level without distorting. If you tried with other processors to crank up the color level too much, you get the distortion. And this would be really obvious on any of your digital cameras. And as you can see from this demo tape, it's not obvious on this because of the special circuits. The second thing is the flesh tone. A lot of processors claim that they can correct flesh tone, but what they're really doing is a linear phase adjust. Now that'll work to correct flesh tones in somewhat, but at the same time it shifts some of the other colors. With the BVP4+, Plus, you get the improved flesh tones without the dramatic shift in the other colors. It's called a non-linear optimized phase shift. And what we did is this actually, by turning this knob up, as you turn it up, actually add certain colors and subtract certain colors at the same time to give you the improved flesh tone without a dramatic change in the dress somebody's wearing or a suit somebody's wearing. So those are two things that you're not going to find on any other processor. We have the tint adjustments or we call the color adjustments here and unlike tint adjustments in a normal processor that might just tint over and change different colors like the black and and the whites, the BVP4 color adjustments actually does a full phase adjust without affecting the blacks and the whites of the signal. Because it's a linear phase adjust, it shifts everything equally. On a lot of less expensive processors, you'll shift the phase and the reds might go 50 degrees, but the greens or the blues might go 45 degrees. This is a linear, a true linear, so as you turn it, everything shifts in equal proportion. Notice that the black and white signal does not change when the color changes, unlike other processors. Another very powerful feature of the BVP4 Plus that you can't find anywhere else is this point-to-point -point luminance control. This is a way to actually get a brighter, sharper picture with better signal-to-noise ratio without losing contrast. With normal video processors, you just have a setup or an IRE knob. Now, adjusting a setup and IRE knob is nice, and you can get some nice compromised shots, but it doesn't do what the point-to-point -point luminance do, which is actually brighten the signal and make it richer and crisper without losing contrast. Normal processors, as I said, have the IRE, and when you turn up the IRE, you just sort of get that washed out kind of look. But with the point to point luminance, as you can see, it actually gives you a brighter picture without losing contrast. And if you turn it up real bright, you then might decide to go back to the color level and add some of that super saturation. So a combination of the color level with the point to point luminance works really well. We like to turn down the IRE a notch or two because we find that in combination with turning up the point to point, you turn down the IRE a little bit, you have a nice combination picture that looks really smooth on the screen. Another reason the BVP4 Plus is so unique and different from any other kind of processing unit is the resolution boost. If you see on some processors you have some kind of sharpness control where they claim to boost resolution, but they really do is they boost the whole upper end of the band, band uh, frequency and you get uh, edging, ghosting, artifacts. 
with the resolution boost, this is the same thing that NASA uses in their Landsat satellite image enhancers where they take pictures from satellite of Earth. It's the only one, and we had NASA engineers work on this, that enhances the image without adding that sharpness and ghosting. And it does it through a process called homomorphic digital signal processing. And it's a very, very extremely complicated way to give yourself better sharpness. This is the only unit that has it, and in combination with those other things is why we get such a great picture using it. Here you have Black Restore. Another thing unique that we saw earlier in the tape, it's able to search out for the back sort of the way a chroma key does and just replace it with jet black. And this is really important because when you're using a combination of point-to-point -point and IRE, you can replace the black without affecting the other colors. You know, we could show you here that the black is replaced, but everything else stays the same. And that's really important. You can't get that on any other processor with setup levels and video levels and IRE levels. You try to do, there's always some compromise. With the Black Restore, there's no compromise. Just dial in what you need. You may not need it for all scenes or for all videos you're doing, but I just leave mine on a little bit all the time. The BVP4 Plus has this switch on the back that controls the circuit in time, inside. It's a digital gamma curve corrector. You know, when you're using a digital format like the digital camcorders, there's a little bit of compression, and as a result, what they call the gamma curve is slightly skewed instead of linear. This brings it back to linear. Bottom line to your picture, it allows you to get a little bit more detail to your picture. It works whether or not the split screen is on or off, so you can't see it with the split screen, but if you flick it back and forth, you notice a little bit of different bringing out the highlights in the darker areas of the picture. The BVP4 and 4 Plus both have composite and S-Video in, but you can go out in composite and out uh, S-Video, or you can go in S-Video and out composite. As a matter of fact, going in S composite and out S-Video gives you a nice uh, uh, composite to YC converter that works really pretty well. So just to recap here, this is not like your normal proc amp for a video because of all the unique controls. If you're using the digital camcorder now, but you're going to a format like Hi8 or SVHS, the BVP4 Plus is going to give you a lot of control, similar to what you've seen on this tape. When you decide to go to digital nonlinear editing or digital tape editing, you're going to be able to get even more control out of this because what happens with the digital is what you see is what you get going into it. As a matter of fact, we recommend using the BVP4 Plus right out of your footage, right out of your Sony camcorder or whatever camcorder footage into this box and then into your edit master. Although you can use it for making copies, it's best to get the signal as earlier on as possible. We have a lot of people with digital nonlinear editing systems that are using this now. They take the digital camcorder out, which is already a time-based corrected image out in uh, the SVHS, go into the back with the digital source format switched here, and go out of this unit into their Media 100, 100 Avid, uh, toaster system, it doesn't matter. Um, if you're using digital nonlinear, as a lot of people are doing, and they're going right from their footage into here onto their digital hard drive, what this unit enables you to do is give that hard drive a much better picture. And once it's gone out to the hard drive and stored in the hard drive, it's stored as a better picture. There is no degradation. And then you do your editing and you make your VHS copies from that, they'll come out a lot better than if you didn't use the BVP4+. Plus. I'm glad you could spend a little time on this tape with me today. I'm also glad you could watch the tape and realize that the BVP4 Plus is going to do things for you that other video processors are not going to do. It does not degrade the signal by digitizing it. It has a 1200 line pass through. You have the resolution boost along with the point to point luminance. Combine that with the super saturation color control and the black restore, flesh tone restore, and the digital gamma compensator. Everything in this box you have, you can't get in any other box. And as a result, trying any other kind of processor is not going to get you anywhere near the improvements that you see here. I appreciate you spending the time watching this tape and learning about the BVP4 Plus. Over the next couple of years, as everybody goes to digital camcorders and digital editing, you're going to need something that's going to put you in front of the pack, and you definitely got it with the BVP4 Plus. If you have any questions, I'll flash a number on the screen that you can give us a call here at the Elite Video Office. We look forward to talking to you in the future, and look forward to you telling us your success stories that you have with the BVP4 Plus. Nice talking to you, and uh, we'll see you in the future. Take care.